nyo sa mga colleagues ko, uh, Mr. Bongo will be uh, vir virtually present in a few minutes. The same is true with Senator De La Rosa and Senator Cayetano. Uh, good morning to all of you. The resource persons likewise, uh, some are still uh, trying to enter the WebEx uh, platform. Uh, for consideration today are the following bills. Senate Bill 660, or an act providing housing program for teachers, authored by Senator Revillan. And, uh, and then we have Senate Bill 934, an act mandating the provision on site living quarters for public school teachers, providing funds, there, therefore, authored by Senator Grace Poe. And then finally, we have Senate Bill 65, an act providing for the development of sustainable cities and communities in the country and by Senator Cayetano. So to give you a, before I give a brief background on the bills, I'd like to have the Secretariat acknowledge all our resource persons present and all those who would be attending. We would like to acknowledge our distinguished resource persons, starting with Secretary of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, Secretary Eduardo del Rosario. From the Department of Education, representing Secretary Leonor Briones, we have Under Secretary Jesus Mateo, Under Secretary Tonesito Umali, Mr. Francis Allen de la Cruz, and Ms. Rexy Kison, representing Secretary Eduardo Año of the Interior uh, Department of Interior and Local Government, we have Under Secretary Rico Judge Echeveri. Representing Secretary Wendell Avisado of the Department of Budget and Management, we have Director Aris Makaspak. From the National Housing Authority, representing Mr. Escalada, we have Ms. Agnes Agay and Engineer Melissa Benedicto. From the Home Development Mutual Fund, uh, we have our CEO, Mr. Ahmad Rizaldi Moti, together with Attorney Jose Roberto Po, Ms. Anela Marie Alena, and Attorney Marshall Pimentel. From the Social Housing Finance Corporation, we have Attorney Ricardo Cabling. Together with Attorney Junife Payot and Mr. Florencio Carandang. From the National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation, we have Dr. Felix Berto Bustos, together with Attorney Dante Patapat and Ms. Carolina Cortez, as well as Mr. Mark Sumimsim. From the Philippine Guarantee Corporation, uh, representing Mr. Alberto Pascual, we have Ms. Melinda Adriano, Mr. Jimmy Sarona, and Mr. Teresito Cayo Botardo. From the Bureau of Fire Protection, representing Director Jose M. Bang Jr., we have Senior Superintendent Romeo Maltezo. From the Land Registration Authority, we have Deputy Administrator uh, representing uh, we have Deputy Administrator Attorney Robert, Robert Nomar Le Retana. From the Subdivision and Housing Developers Association, representing Mr. Rafael Felix, we have Attorney Marian Reina Cruz. From the Chamber of Real Estate and Builders Associations, or CREBA, we have Mr. Noel Toti Carino. From the League of Provinces of the Philippines, Representing Governor Presbitero Velasco Jr., we have Ms. Angelica Sanchez. From uh, the League of Cities and Municipalities, we also have a representative. Uh, we have Dr. Colin Russo. Yes, sir. From the University of Sunshine Coast, Australia. And Professor Sherman Cruz. Uh, director for uh, the Center for Engaged Foresight. That's all for now, Mr. Chair. Salamat, salamat. So, 
Nakita niyo po yung ang dami ng ang dami ng resource persons natin. Meron pa tayo sa coming from Australia, but I promise you will be uh, finished by 8 by 10:30 considering that the Senate will be having a necrological uh, ceremony for the late Senator Ramon Revilla Sr. So we we end up by by 10:30 and I and I promise you we will uh, do so. So we'll we'll stick by uh, the time limit uh, provided by the Secretariat, five minutes presentation. But uh, most probably, we will be having a second hearing. Parang nawala sa screen. Nawala sa screen. So uh, we, we proceed to give a background on the bills. Uh, Senate bill... To give a background on the bill, Senate bill 660 and 934 are interrelated. So we will be hearing them jointly, uh, focusing on the provision of a housing program for teachers. Senate Bill 660, filed by Senator Revilla, calls for the institutionalization of a housing program for teachers by providing funds through loans at a very affordable interest rate, I think 12%, and a flexible repayment period. But I but I understand some, uh, some comments emanated from... Uh, from the Pagibig group and the or, or the Home Mutual Development Fund, that they are uh, against some of the provision of the. Pro we have Senate Bill 934, providing for free on site living quarters for public school teachers, which aims to provide on site housing and on board lodging for public school teachers who are teaching away from their homes and families, among others. It seeks to ensure that the remotest areas all over the country would, la would not lack competent and dedicated public school teachers. We are doing this, we are hearing these bills, these twin bills, even though there is a proposal or th there is a program now emanating from DepEd that they would be doing online. What, what we are trying to achieve in the, in the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic is that to provide for a future long-term uh, situation where in face-to-face -face classes would have to resume and 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 that is the time we, we can have the proper legal framework this, this twin proposals from our colleagues in the senate senator Rivilla and senator grace po seeks to uplift the standard of life, life of our teachers who live in remote areas or are having difficulties in transportation access to let to go to the schools they teach in Kung nakikita nyo po at nababalitaan, marami po tayong mga teachers na doon na natutulog sa classrooms. Uh, good morning, Secretary Del Rosario. I, I see your, uh, uh, you are now virtually present. So marami po doon na natutulog sa classrooms at wala po talaga silang matirahan. The possibility of subsidizing their housing will not only alleviate their financial difficulties, it will also attract more teachers to enter the public service and would improve their well-being, which then may translate to better teaching environment in a class. Ang problema po dito, ganito, uh, yung teachers po natin, hindi naman po sila nakakapili kung saan magtuturo. Uh, kung saan sila ma-assign, kung saan may bakante, doon sila nagtuturo. Hindi po ito uh, parehas doon sa uh, Doctors to the Barrio program of the Department of Health na ngayon, ang balita ko, voluntary na. So they have the option whether to uh, go to the barrio or not. There, thereafter, we will be hearing on the second part of this uh, committee hearing, Senate Bill 65. Senate Bill number 65 or the Sustainable Cities and Communities Act seeks to fulfill our international obligations with regards to our Sustainable Development Goal number 11 of the Sustainable Development Agenda of the United Nations. It aims to address the problems brought about by rapid urban growth and ensure the development of cities and communities in the country will be geared towards sustainability by encouraging and providing necessary support to LGUs so that they can transition into sustainable cities and communities. Senate Bill Number 65, authored by Senator Cayetano, is very timely as the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed mounting problems regarding urban sustainability program. Kung makikita nyo po, nilunsad, pinirmahan ng ating Pangulo yung Balik Probinsya Program. Hindi po ito pang COVID-19 lang. So marami talagang I ililipat, ililikas, dadalhin sa mga probinsya. The pandemic has highlighted the need for the policy and infrastructural reforms in Philippine urban setting. 
access to services and infrastructures, connectivity, waste management, as well as urban concentration are only some of the concerns and laid bare by the health hazards and social restriction challenges of the pandemic. But sust sustainability transcends this contagion and we must look for solutions. For this reason, more than ever, we have to review and recalibrate our approach on urban development. By 2050, more than half of the population of the world will be living in urban centers. Eh, yun nakikita natin problema ngayon sa Cebu City sa COVID-19. Talagang nandun, nakakonsentrate po ang, ang tao sa Cebu City, urban center. Uh, yung mga galing po ng Northern Cebu, yung mga galing ng Southern Cebu, lahat gustong tumira sa, sa Cebu City. Ganon din po sa Metro Manila. The World Bank has all urged all countries, and I quote, work collectively to make cities more livable and design our health, safety, and well-being, and it is our duty to hit our people. So we call upon uh, the DILG as well as the DSHUD to probably make statements later on. So we, we proceed, uh, proceeding with limited time, we tackle Senate Bills 660 and 934. Ito po yung sa mga teachers. Uh, ang sinasabi po ng pag-ibig, hindi na raw po timely itong bill na ito dahil uh, iba na yung sitwasyon ngayon. Wala na pong 120,000 na bahay. Wala na pong uh, uh, 12%. Hindi na po ganun kababa ang sweldo ng ating mga maestra. So may, may we hear briefly the position of uh, pag-ibig thereafter uh, DepEd and then we, we, we will hear a reaction coming from the private sector. Pag-ibig, pagsabayin nyo na po itong uh, uh, Senate Bill 660 and 934. Is there a representative from Pagibig? Sino yung Pagibig? Wala pa yung Pagibig. So may, may we hear a, a, the, the position of uh, uh, Dijud, Secretary De Lozario. You're recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, uh, the position of Pagibig is uh, right. Uh, even though the uh, salary of the uh, teachers uh, are now high and they are capable of uh, 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 getting a loan from uh, Pagibig to finance uh, their housing uh, requirement. Uh, actually, we are continuously supporting the request of our uh, teachers, public school teachers, uh, in fact, in 2018 alone. We have uh, provided uh, housing to 4,444 uh, employees, which is 39.43% of the 11,269 housing loans extended to government employees in 2018. And this amounts to 4 billion pesos. And I think this, this reflects the, uh, the current uh, salary of the, of the school teachers that they can really afford to avail of housing loan, housing payout, propaganda fund, and they can uh, pay regularly on a monthly basis. So it's now within their capacity, uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Honours. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, what you're saying is that uh, there is no more urgent necessity for the passage of Bill 660, in view of the changed circumstances, teachers are receiving more. Uh, plus, I think you're in harmony with the position of Pag-ibig that uh, there, is, there is no more need to have a separate uh, window for teachers because Pag-ibig is supposed to cater not just to public school teachers, but even to private employees as well. Ganun po ba? Uh, with regards to the uh, pag -ibig. but uh, in as far as the National Housing Authority is concerned, uh, still uh, uh, government employees, including uh, teachers, can avail of the housing uh, programs being implemented by the National Housing Authority. Pero, uh, Secretary, ma 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 matigil ko kayo saglit, napakarami pong uh, ginawang programa ng uh, maging ng National Housing Authority para sa ating mga teachers, maging sa mga sundalo natin at kapulisan na sa ngayon, kahit nagawa na yung, yung mga nasabing mga bahay, eh hindi naman po naakupahan. So marami po itong, marami po itong uh, 
marami po itong mga examples na gano'n na nangyari. Pero ito po yung realidad and I hope the other resource, person, or resource persons are listening. Kung meron pong bagong teacher sa probinsya, bagong pasa, malamang-lamang po ito kung babae, dalaga, 22, 23 years old. Ma-assign sa isang lugar kung saan magtuturo. Pakatapos nito ang COVID. At malamang-lamang po ito, hindi pa po ito mag-a-avail ng isang housing loan. Kasi hindi pa niya sigurado kung siya ay doon talaga titira. Malamang-lamang po kung babae ito, kung makapang-asawa po ito, eh baka hindi naman tagaroon doon sa, sa baro yung pinagtuturoan niya. Kung siya po ay tiga pagadian, malamang-lamang ay eh, na, na, nakasign siya sa Mulabe o sa ibang mga lugar. So, hindi pa po siya mag-a-avail. Kung ang tutukuyin naman po natin ay eh, yung medyo maedad na na teacher, hindi ko naman sinasabi maedad na, 36 years old, nakapag-masters na, malapit na maging principal, nakapag-asawa na po ito. So kung mag-avail po ito ng, ng bahay, hindi po ito doon sa lugar na hindi po niya gugustuhin sa lugar na kanyang malamang-lamang temporary assignment kung hindi kung saan siya talaga permanenteng nakatira. Ito po yung problema natin, Secretary. Ganon din po sa mga sundalo at sa kapulisan. Malamang-lamang yung inaalok na bahay o yung housing project ay hindi po talaga doon sa lugar na kanilang tinitirahan. Ganon din po, malamang-lamang po, temporary lang po yung kanilang pinagtuturuan para sa kanila. So, I think the, the bill of Senator Grace po, ito pong Senate, uh, uh, Senate Bill 934, seeks to address another problem, a free on-site living quarters for public school teachers kasi temporary lang po sila, libre naman po ito. So, we're trying to reconcile Uh, these two bills, paano po ito na, kasi uh, Secretary, I have, here, I have here all the records and and I'd like the DILG to respond thereafter and uh, National Housing Authority. Noong 1970s po, ang uh, National Housing Authority, nagtayo ng Teachers Village. Dito po sa Quezon City, ito po yung mga Marangal Street, Maginhawa Street na nababalitaan natin. Ito po yung sa Barangay Cruz na Ligas. So ang nakatira po dito, hindi na po teachers ngayon. Retired na po yun. Second generation na po yun. Pinagsama-sama lang po yun doon noong 1970s, 75, ng National Housing Authority. The same is true with a teacher's village established in Antipolo. The National Housing Authority in Barangay de La Paz, Antipolo, Rizal, ay nagtayo rin ng isang teacher's village exclusively for teachers. Eh kung hindi ka naman po nagtuturo sa Antipolo, eh bakit ka doon titira? Kung ikaw ay nagtuturo sa Kainta, nagtuturo sa Mandaluyong, paano ka mag-uwi ang araw-araw? So ito po, yung, ito po yung naging problema natin. I'm sure uh, this is the reality in so far as the, the soldiers and the policemen are concerned. Noong 1984, meron po si Presidente Marcos naman tinayo, Teachers Bliss Condominium sa Balintawak, Quezon City, uh, at ang isa po ay sa Tondo, for sure project. So, lahat pong ito, hindi ko alam kung teachers pa ho ang nakatira, ay nagpapatunay na nabigyan nga natin ng, ng tirahan yung mga teachers pero hindi po na, 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 natugon yung kadahilanan kaya natin sila binigyan ng, ng pabahay ay para malapit po sila doon sa kanilang pinagtuturuan at hindi sila natutulog sa classroom. So th there will be uh, probably some uh, amendments to this Uh, to, to, to do away with previous uh, situations like for instance dito po sa Eastern Visaya sa yung National Housing Authority uh, built houses for uniform personnel pero ngayon binigay na lang alam nyo to Secretary Delosar binigay na lang po sa mga homeless families sa Tacloban so all of this we learn, we're learning from experience and at the same time We're trying to craft legislation that would provide our teachers some semblance of housing dignity. So, pag-ibig, nandiyan na ba kayo? Wala pa? May, may we hear a quick uh, reaction position from the DepEd family? DepEd? DepEd, are you there? You speak, Mateo? Is recognized? Yusek Matayas recognize. If you're there, wala pa? 
AILG, can you comment on this? Mr. Chair, good morning to all the members of the Senate and uh, our fellow resource, resource speaker. Uh, we find herein proposed teachers housing program in line with the state's policy to free the people from poverty through policies that provide a rising standard of living and an improved quality of life for all. In view thereof, the department interposes no objection to the enactment of the proposed measure. We shall, however, defer the privilege of providing detailed comments and inputs to specific provisions thereof to the Department of Education and other government agencies involved in its implementation under Senate Bill Number 660. Mr. Chair. You, you say, I, I think you should uh, likewise comment on Senate Bill uh, 934 of uh, Senate. Yes, Mr. Chair. Considering yes. it would, it would uh, take a slice on the Special Education Fund, which is provided yes, for Mr. the local government. But how soon can you provide your position paper on this? Can, can I read it now, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. The department recognizes under Senate Bill Number 934 here in proposed measure intent to alleviate the public school teacher's condition of employment through the provision of free on-site living quarters. Specifically, the department interposes no objection to the proposal that additional funding may be sourced from the special education fund of the local government unit. However, as to the phrase arising from the real property tax collected by concerned local government units, where the living quarters shall be constructed and or located, may we suggest that the feasibility of this imposed condition pro pro proportion be consulted with the Bureau of Local Government Finance or the Department of Budget and Management. Finally, as to the Department of the Interior Local Government, Proposed involvement in the preparation of the implementing rules and regulation. We find the same with no objection, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Yusek. Even dun sa special education fund, wala kayong uh, objections doon? As to the SEP, sir, we, we also have no objections. Thank you. I understand the National Housing Authority is here uh, with the indulgence of uh, Secretary De Lozario. NHA, nagkakaproblema kasi sa connectivity. Pag-ibig... Uh, Nandiyan na kanina eh. Ngayon may uh, internet difficulty sila. So, National Housing Authority is recognized. NHA? Uh, sir? Can you identify yourself? Miss Agnes Agay of NHA, you're recognized. Wala rin, wala rin. May problema rin sa connectivity. Oh, am I... Naririnig po ako? Yes, naririnig namin kayo. Go ahead. Okay. I will, sir, I will read the position paper of NHA. Is that okay? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so, sir, yung... Uh, as to the first, ano, NHA's capacity to undertake uh, special housing projects for teachers as proposed by... Uh, Senate Bill Number 16 depends sir, on yearly aspirations by Congress for housing development. So, siguro ang aming stand dito will reiterate a recommendation for a greater role for ng LGU in the proposed teachers housing program. With partnership with NHA, LGUs can provide the counterpart funding for funds for housing development among the other possible support we can offer. Dun ho sa SB Number uh, 660 also, here's uh, uh, SB 934 to provide free living quarters for the. Kami ho, eh, we are concerned lang ho that providing free living quarters, whether through construction of new housing units, and a change. sustainable use of government resources. So, NHA suggests, lang, sir, considering a subsidy framework that supports the housing needs of public school teachers instead of fully uh, free living arrangements. So, yan po yung position ng NHA in terms of SB 934. Can you repeat that? Uh, yung, yung, yung last sentence nyo? Kasi ang pinag-uusapan natin dito, uh, and I, I, I hope this should be listening, is the provision uh, even if if the salary grade of teachers were already increased uh, pursuant to the salary standardization act 
provision of a last mile uh, uh, housing facility for teachers in remote areas. So hindi lang po yung nakatira dito sa Metro Manila o Metro Cebu, yun nandun pala talaga, yun nandun talaga sa mga liblib na na lugar ng Tuburan sa Cebu, yun nandun sa mga dulo, mga pagitan ng Compostela Valley at Agusan doon sa area na yon. So ito yung mga ito yung tina-target na to and and we understand that your 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 uh, familiar with the proposals uh, GSIS and HDMF will be contributing a total of 2 billion pesos under the proposed measure uh, 1 billion each and the national government through the general appropriations act will be providing 1 billion pesos annually so ang magiging budget nito ay 3 billion uh, NHA go ahead hindi ko lang nakuha yung last na sinabi mo ma'am yung last one na sinabi ko ay Sinabi sir that considering lang a subsidy support the housing needs of instead of the arrangement. I think some 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 someone behind you has a as a as a gadget turned on so can you repeat that again for the last uh, the guys you have turned on? So, can you repeat that again for the last one? Uh, sir, uh, we are suggesting instead of three living quarters, we are considering a subsidy that supports their housing needs. So, how much will be the subsidy? Mm -hmm. Parang, parang, uh, it's not as if you're giving it for free, so, but we are proposing a subsidy payment that we can probably craft with the Department of Housing, sir. It's in a and, and how much would be the subsidy? And where, where will you get the subsidy? Sir, that would still be national government funds. Kung ganon. So, so the take-home pay of the teachers, dito sa mga proposals, uh, should not be less than 4,000. Wala na talaga magagalaw. Yes, sir. So, so that would mean that the that the subsidy will be in place as long as the teachers are stationed in remote areas. Yeah, that would be considered. But but that would not answer the permanency of a house for teachers. So habang nandun lang siya, pasyon uwi na uli siya sa Cebu City. Wala na siya sa Tupura. Ganun po ba? Uh, ganun nga, sir. So, depend any reaction here. Kasi sabi mo, NHA, similar to the chalk allowance, bigyan siya ng subsidy. Similar to the proposed load allowance for the online teachers this coming school year, subsidy rin yun, bigyan pa siya ng housing subsidy. Is that correct? Internet kasi. NHA? Uh, sir, uh, how's that? Sa halip lang po ng bahay, Bigyan na lang ng subsidy, umupa na lang siya. Ganun po ba? Ay, that, that could be a possible alternative, sir. Hindi, kasi sinasabi mo kanina, subsidy na lang. Subsidy magtayo ng bahay o subsidy umupa ng bahay? Subsidy na umupa ng bahay, sir. Kasi well, wala pa naman yung, yung development and construction of permanent housing for them. So, at the meantime, there's a possibility na kung you, you subsidize their rental arrangement. Any any comment coming from uh, Dishud? Quick reaction, sir. You, uh, Secretary Del Rosario. Nawala si Secretary Del Rosario. Ang hirap talaga ng internet connection. Uh, I understand. We have pag-ibig on board. Uh, Secretary Del Rosario, go ahead. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for on-site uh, living quarters for public school teachers, I think what uh, we should do is for, for the construction of uh, temporary uh, housing facilities in these remote areas that must be integrated into the budget of the Fed. Just like construction of their uh, classrooms, the uh, living facilities should be integrated into the budget of the Fed. So in that way, it will be permanent, will be maintained by the Fed, and it will not require uh, resources from other agencies. Uh, if I may suggest, uh, Mr. Chairman. So, sir, you're not amenable to the suggestion of uh, 
ano siya, nagbigyan na lang ng parang chok allowance, housing allowance, buka na lang sila. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, because this will solve everything on security, transportation of the teachers, because the uh, living quarters will be constructed inside the uh, campus of the uh, different schools. Assuming that there are uh, spaces uh, to house the housing facilities, Uh, yes, uh, mostly in uh, rural areas, we have uh, adequate lots to uh, uh, to provide for the construction of temporary shelters. And we consider that as the product coming from the shoot. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that would uh, put permanence to resolve this uh, issue of providing uh, living quarters for uh, teachers who will be working in remote areas. But, but uh, Secretary, if you not address the, the need to provide decent housing for the teacher, on a permanent basis, because it is permanent to tear the school. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, but in general, Pag-Ibig can provide a housing loan takeouts to Pag-Ibig wherever they would like to permanently reside as public school teachers. So that is being provided by uh, Pagibig as a member of the Pagibig Fund. And this is ongoing, right? Yes, yes I'm right. Uh, Mr. Roberto Po of uh, the Pagibig Fund is on board right now. Pagibig. Attorney Po, are you virtually able to connect? We recognize... Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Roberto uh, Po. Well, Attorney, good morning, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Because we have limited time. Hello, sir. Good morning, sirs. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead, Attorney. We can hear you. Go ahead, Pagibig. I think we, we, we can't... Uh, hold Pag-ibig on, on the same wavelength as the show this. Uh, may we recognize, while waiting for Pag-ibig, those from the private sector, I, I saw the virtual presence of uh, Mr. Carino on the private sector. Mr. Carino, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, very interesting. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Wait, wait. Uh, we, uh, we, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Carino uh, now has the floor. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Carino, and then I'll recognize Pagibig. Go ahead, Mr. Carino. Please. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Carino. We appreciate the position that provides that particular solution for the teachers. But it would also be, I think, the solution espoused by the secretary is a good solution to build temporary housing units where they can probably rent up, especially in remote areas, and still avail of the Pag-Ibig loans on areas where they would they want to settle down permanently. Uh, putting on-site uh, putting on -site, uh, accommodations for the teachers on the campus itself is a very good solution for this particular problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, uh, in effect, you're in, you're in agreement with the proposal coming from Secretary Del Rosario. Uh, thank yes. you, sir. Pagibig, yeah, you're now recognized. Attorney Po, Pagibig. Mr. Chairman, good good morning, Mr. Chairman. Yes, is this Pagibig? Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So, with a good morning uh, introduction. Pag-ibig, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Pag-ibig fund police supports the Senate Bill number six. Well, difficulty with the... Uh, the teachers are housing 
program, Free for the Savings Fund and Home Financing Program previously extend the uh, housing loans to Ah, uh, pag-ibig, attorney po, I'm sorry, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, understand what you're saying. It's, it's, uh, you're perhaps not properly connected. So, may, may we, may we get the, I, I see, a, I see a lady taking a live video chat, uh, Miss Ann Rachel Miguel, you represent what office? Um, hello, uh, good morning, uh, Senator Tolentino and the members of the uh, this committee. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't um, taking a video shot, uh, Your Honor. I was just uh, reading, I'm reading um, uh, the Senate bills for uh, honor. You represent what office? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Department of Education. My apologies, Your Honor. I wasn't uh, taking a shot uh, or taking a video of speaking. Uh, my apologies, really. What, what is the position of that here? I, uh, Your Honor, uh, Your Honor, I'm, uh, I'm uh, the di a director of uh, the Bureau of Human Resources of DepEd, and uh, we also uh, uh, welcome this uh, measure, Your Honor, uh, in so far as uh, providing. Um, Giving quarters to uh, the teachers, Your Honor. I, I, I really apologize, Your Honor. I wasn't taking any video, Your Honor. Is, uh... No problem, ma'am. Uh, is, is you Mr. Sir, uh, Mr. Yes, good morning. Uh, Yusek, dalawang bills ito, eh, and, and we're running out of time here. Yung, yung first bill, uh, as commented by the Dishud and, and, and uh, probably Pag-Ibig, there, there probably might some be some uh, uh, ingredients out of, out of date. But the second bill filed by Senator Grace Paul calls for temporary housing provisions for our teachers in remote areas. So may, may we get the position of the pet because while you were uh, not yet around, I mentioned several uh, historical uh, incidents in the teachers' village in Antipolo, circa. 1991, and a teacher's uh, bliss condominium in Metro Manila, 1984, and one in 1975. But Pag-ibig is of the opinion that probably there is a no need for this right now. So any position here, uh, Yusek Kumali? Mr. Chair, we support both the Senate bills filed by Senator, Senator uh, Ramon Bongovilla and uh, Senator Grace Paul, particularly uh, the latter bill, uh, Mr. Chair, which uh, provides for uh, the establishment of living quarters for our teachers uh, near uh, our school. Uh, surely, Mr. Chair, yung ganito pong uh, uh, binipisyo sa ating mga guro, malaking bagay po yan. Dahil po, mayroon nga po tayo tulad ng nabanggit ko ninyo, Mr. Chair, na mga paaralan sa mga napakalayong lugar at yung mga nakikita nyo po sa mga programa sa, sa television na naglalakad po ng pagkalayo-layo ang aming mga guro dahil uh, wala nga po naman silang uh, matirahan malapit po doon at sila po ay uh, nakatira halimbawa sa uh, poblasyon. Hindi po natin dinisuspekto yung lugar na nabito yung paaralan na napakalayo, island barangay. Ay talaga pong napakahirap noon. And this will really be referred here, notwithstanding the localization law, because we have this localization law of the state giving priority to teachers be in a particular locality to be deployed to be in a school uh, near to the residence 
of the teacher. Pero may mga sitwasyon nga po, teacher, na pag malayo po yan, ay eh, wala rin naman pong gurong malapit doon po na nakatira. At kasi yung localization lo, naglalayong matugunan nga po yung piso ng distansya ng uh, paaralan sa sinisirahan ng guro at nang sila'y pag naglalakbay ay hindi po napakahirap, ay hindi pa rin po patutugunan. Kaya napakaganda po ng paano kalapatas po ito ng atin pong uh, Senadora Grace po, Mr. Chair. At pati po yung po, Senator Bong Rivilla, Mr. Chair, okay din po yun. Sec, Yusek Umali, uh, if I may interrupt you, there, there was a counter-proposal coming from uh, Secretary Del Rosario that instead of providing separate, separate facilities for teachers in another location, which would entail probably the acquisition of a land or uh, the construction of housing facilities, bakit daw po hindi na lang doon sa, sa loob ng eskwelahan itayo yung housing facility para doon sa mga guro natin? Kasi kanina, habang wala pa kayo, nabanggit ko, ito pong mga guro natin, most probably 22, 23, 26 years old, ito po yung mga bagong teachers pa lang na pinagtu magtuturo doon sa hindi naman nila lugar kung saan sila uh, pangkasalukuyang naninirahan. So these are temporary shelters, not halfway houses, uh, na gusto ni Secretary Del Rosario. Doon na lang sa school compound itayo. Kasi na, sinabi ko kanina, yung marami na, nakatira na lang sa classroom para hindi malate. So are you in agreement with the, the proposal coming from uh, Secretary Del Rosario? Uh, we can't hear you. You're, you're, you please unmute. Mr. Chair, pasensya na po kayo kanina dahil nahihirapan po ako makapasok. I have to get several links bago po ako nakapasok, kaya po kami na-late. Mr. Chair, pwede rin po yun, basta wala pong issue ng lack of buildable space. At maski may buildable space, Mr. Chair, sana po wala pong issue na baka mas magandang katayuan po ito ng civil paralan kasi baka limitado pa rin po yung buildable space na meron. So halit na living quarters ng mga guro, baka civil paralan pa rin po ang kakayanin based on the projection on the enrollment uh, in a particular school. So kung wala pong ganong issue, Mr. Chair, sa mga malalayo yung lugar, Mr. Chair, medyo malalawak ang lupa po ng ating kagawaran at wala pong issue ng kakulangan ng espasyo, pwede rin po yun, Mr. Chair. That's why you need now the help of the local government units. Alam mo, Sec. Yusek, nung araw may mga home economics building, may mga home economics classes. Usually yung mga classrooms na yun, merong kusina. Merong home economics teacher. Eh siguro, pwedeng i-dikit na yun doon. Yung sinasabi ni, ni Secretary Del Rosario na maging pansamantalang tirahan ng mga, ng mga guro. And then we, we had a proposal coming from the National Housing Authority na bigyan na lang ng housing allowance. Yung hindi makakatira doon para umupa na lang sa iba. So right now, you have a chalk allowance. You will be having a, a internet load allowance. Ang sinasabi ng NHA, housing allowance. And most probably, I'll be asking the DBM, this will be uh, called from the budget of the Department of Education. You Mr. Said. Chair, anything that will help our teachers to be more effective and efficient in performing their functions, we support for Mr. Chair. Maraming po salamat. Na, salamat, uh, Yusek Umali. I understand that uh, uh, DBM is there. May, 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 we, may we ask the uh, position of DBM? De Director Makaspak, are you there? O nahirapan din mag-connect? Hi, sir. Good morning, sir. Yes, go ahead. This is DBM, uh, right? Yes, sir. From the Department of Budget and Management, sir. Uh, sir, may, may we respect for inform that the DBM has already submitted the paper. The proposed measure to the letter dated April 7, 2020 of uh, Secretary Wendell Abisado for the Honorable Committee. So may, may we just register, Mr. Chairman, that that is the position of the Department of Budget and Management. Yes, but the new proposals coming from NHA calls for the housing allowance and then uh, the, new, the other proposal coming from Secretary Del Rosario calls for the establishment of living quarters within the school compound. So any uh, reaction relative to this new 
counter proposals at the DBM? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, I, I do apologize, sir, because uh, I am in charge of the bureau. I'm the director handling the the local government units, but there's another bureau handling the head, so I cannot uh, really provide inputs at this point in time. But uh, I will take note of that, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I will refer it to the appropriate bureau for the submission of official position paper in that regard. Uh, th thank you, DBM. Siguro isama mo na rin sa sa memo mo kay Secretary Wendell Apisado uh, in view of these new developments, is, is the DBM, uh, has the DBM been doing a land acquisition in so far as new school sites are concerned? Uh, hindi, hindi kasali ang uh, LGU. Pwede ba yung ganon? But can you just refer? Uh, Sorry. I will take note of that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I see the presence of a uh, Attorney Kabling of Shiafsi. Uh, may we have the position of Shiafsi? Attorney Kabling, are you uh, connected right now? Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Uh, sir, we support the position of our chairman, Secretary Del Rosario. Uh, so your position uh, so your is position the construction uh, uh, housing facilities housing within the facilities within. Yes, sir. Thank you. Although eventually, sir, eventually later, if the, if the teachers could organize it to communities, they can avail of our housing program because our housing program is community based. Probably part of the advocacy there is just, it's not just education but also housing. They can organize the community and come up with a community organization and association and avail of loan from us so we could put up a new community there where they are assigned as teachers. But meantime, sir, Sir, because I'm it will take some time. It will take some time to support the position of Secretary de Rosario. But I would say, uh, in going to remote areas, teachers could could uh, advance to advocacy, education, and at the same time housing by organizing the community and coming with their own plan and apply to us for a community housing program. Sir. Attorney, matanong ko lang. Matanong ko lang. Pwedeng yung posibilidad yung ng housing cooperative ang mga magtayo ang ang grupo ng papahay ng facility sa loob ng isang school. Halimbawa, ang problema namin sa story, three story, three story, sa mga teachers, tinatayo, o NHA, teachers ay nagtayo sa isang housing co-op. Yes, sir, as long as DepEd would allow it, sir. Ayun, si DepEd. Because all those properties are owned by DepEd. The presence of Chester Piyak is now. Deped, any reaction? Deped, uh, any reaction? Uh, between me and Chester uh, Piyak. Yusek Umali? Yusek Umali? Yes, Mr. Chair. Opo. Opo. Ang sumasabi ko po, hindi po ba tayo bumukos isang music po po mga guro sa isang lugar at mga magigita ng siyapi o government agency kapag tayo na isang structure na magigay ay magigita ng isang kooperatiba. Si is waiting for the fly off. Ha ha. Alam niyo, kukumanin po ninyo, Mr. Chair. Kukumanin po ninyo, Mr. Chair. Eko po kayo, Mr. Chair. Eko po kayo, Mr. Chair. Eko po yung banda ko si Mahagi. Eko ang banda ko yung top. Eko ang banda ko yung top. Hindi natin marinig kasi somebody turned on his microphone simultaneous with the others. So, we recognize Yusek Gumalik. And can we request the others to mute their microphones? Minister Chair, malinaw na po kayo, Mr. Chair. Nung huling bahagi lamang po. Nung, Go ahead. Nung, yung huling bahagi po nang nabanggit niya, Mr. Chair, ang tanong po ninyo kung okay po magkayo ang uh, yes. kooperatiba, Mr. Chair? Yes, yes. A teacher's housing cooperative uh, constructing a housing structure within the school compound financed by other government agencies and uh, perhaps subsidized partly by the LGU, 
or even uh, co-financed by the, the DepEd? If, if, if Mr. Chair, kung wala pong usapin lang po ng buildable space, kung wala pong issue ng buildable space for our classrooms and school buildings, in principle, that should be okay, Mr. Chair. Basta Thank wala lang pong issue ng buildable space. Any reaction from uh, uh, Secretary Del Rosario? Secretary Del Rosario, are you still there? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, actually, uh, if we will be forming a cooperative, uh, that would be a viable uh, solution uh, also. But uh, still, we go for the uh, for the uh, temporary shelter to be uh, constructed. Uh, because that is very uh, logical and it will put permanence to the needs of the teachers for uh, temporary housing in remote areas. If it's not possible to construct within the school compound to the nearest available that can be built of or given by, owned by the LGU, where the, uh, this uh, temporary shelter can be constructed. And it can cater to nearby schools within that municipality or barangay, uh, Mr. Chairman. Hindi lang para doon sa mga nagtutupunan, hindi kahit doon sa mga ibang municipality, malaking kapit na rin doon sa estelahan o sa lugar. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I think yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair? Uh, who is speaking? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, I can hear you. Can hear you. Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask you to ask me 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 to ask me to ask you to ask me to ask you to ask me 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 to ask itong kooperatiba na ito ay magkaroon ng kakayanan na sila po ang mag-manage ng ating school canteen. Ang punto ko pong sinasabi ng Sir ay yung konsepto ng pagbubuo ng kooperatiba sa ating mga guro ay amin pong talagang sinusuportahan yan. At kapag mayroon nga po silang nabuo ng kooperatiba at may kakayanan po silang mag-manage ng school canteen, pinabibigyan po namin yan. Lalong-lalo na po ng Sir Sir. So ito na naman ay isang ang uh, magandang uh, encouragement, motivation for our teachers to group themselves to form a teacher cooperative district here. Yung lokahi po ninyo. Salamat po, Mr. Chair. Salamat, Yusek Umali. Finally, do we have now uh, 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 pag-ibig? Is the pag-ibig chair uh, virtually present? Because I, I would like to have a reaction uh, relative to the concept of teachers cooperative uh, constructing their own uh, facility within the school uh, compound. Sino, sino good, good morning po, Mr. Chair. Si Attorney Marshall Pimentel po, uh, Vice President ng Legal and General yes. Counsel Group po ng Pag-ibig Fund, representing our CEO, uh, Akmad Rizal D. Timothy. Mr. Chair, good morning. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all po, magandang umaga sa lahat. Uh, Ang pag-ibig fund po, sampu ng aming chairman, si Secretary Del Rosario, ang, ang mga members po ng Board of Trustees namin, ang aming CEO, ay sumusuporta sa marangal na hangarin ng mga pangnuka ng batas na ito para sa pabahay ng ating mga guro. Uh, nasabi na po namin sa aming mga position paper na sapat, may mga sapat po na katalukuyang programa ang pag-ibig fund para matugunan yung mga pangangailangan ng pabahay ng aming mga guro. Uh, kasama po dyan yung uh, pakikipag-coordinate sa mga housing cooperative uh, sa katunayan po itong housing cooperative na itatayo para sa mga teachers kahit na sa remote area kung eventually ay bubuin nila yung kanilang sarili bilang isang homeowners association meron po kami mga multiple 
financing programs na pwede pong uh, ibigay po sa kanila, Mr. Chair. Uh, ang challenge lang po, tulad ng nabanggit po namin sa aming position paper, yung unique na uh, nature at character po ng pondo ng pag-ibig fund na private po siya, So, wala pong parang may limitas po, po sa aming charter na magbigay na kalaan ng isang specific na pabahay para sa uh, isang nakalaan na sektor. Pero meron po tayong mga maraming uh, housing loan programs na available po sa lahat kasama na po yung mga guro. So doon po sa panukala, uh, ulitin po lang po natin na doon sa cooperative, lalo na kung sila ay magtatalaga ng isang housing homeowners association later on, handa po ang pag-ibig pa na makipagtulungan para sa pabahay po ng ating mga guro. Maraming salamat po, Mr. Chair. I understand the concern of uh, the legitimate concerns which are valid considering that uh, you're correct, uh, pag-ibig pa is uh, private in, in nature but uh, and, and should not be focused just on a single sector. One last item before we shift to the third uh, bill under consideration. And I'd like uh, Mr. Atencio, formerly of AHADSI, to, to comment on this. I, I, am, I am looking uh, forward to the possibility of portability housing. So meaning to say, if you, are, if, if you invested a certain amount, in a locality as a teacher temporarily based in Mulabe, for instance, and later on you decide to transfer by, by, by marriage or what to another uh, locality, for instance, Pagadian City in Sambuanga del Sur, the amounts you paid during your first five years in the temporary shelter program will be carried over to your permanent housing uh, facility, whether it is in Pagadian City or in Cebu, or in Metro Manila. So ito yung, ito yung naiisip kong concept. And I, I think uh, Pag-ibig can, can, can join the conversation. Is, 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 is this being done? Kasi pag bumili ka ng bahay sa isa, salimbawa, bumili ako ng bahay, bagong teacher ako, bumili ako ng bahay dun sa sinasabi ni Secretary Del Rosario sa isang komunidad malapit sa Municipality of Mulabe, sa Buanga del Sur, eh hindi naman ako magiging permanente roon. Lilipat din ako sa ibang lugar. Yung na, yung mga yung nag yung nahihulog ko na, yung amortization ko na dapat makeri doon naman sa paglilipatan ko na na permanently na lugar at yung papalit sa akin, itutuloy lang niya yung pagbabayad doon kung ito man ay temporary housing facility, kung ito man ay uh, housing cooperative para na sa ganun magamit din niya siya yung bagong graduate na teacher, siya yung titira doon. Ako naman, daladala ko yung kung ano man yung titulong hawak-hawak ko. Kung lilipat ako sa Cebu, kung lilipat ako sa sa Manila, magagamit ko 'yon para na sa ganon pagpapatunay na nakabayad na ako sa Mulabe, ito naman ganyan sa lilipatan ko itutuloy ko rin lang naman. Hindi ako magsisimula uli ng malaking down payment ko na titira eh 10 years to pay na lang, itutuloy ko lang. I I I'm, I'm looking at at that concept and perhaps uh, the experience and wisdom of Mr. Atencio can can provide some amplification. Uh, Mr. Atencio recognized Hello, um, good morning, Secret uh, Secretary De Rosario, Senator Francis. Yes, so to be brief about it, can I just also comment on House Bill 660 and 634? Uh, these are good examples to my mind of special interest legislation that direct benefits and public funding to a certain segment of society. In this particular case, public school teachers. And because they are special interest legislation, there are two basic issues that have to be resolved by the committee. The first issue is equal protection of law. Granting such privileges to public school teachers would necessarily open discussions on other sectors that would be entitled to other benefits. You know, policemen, soldiers, firemen, etc. Even the urban poor. Um, the SB 660, the issue arises really when a piece of legislation provides benefits to a focus group of beneficiaries, but the cost of handling these benefits is borne by a larger, wider segment of society. In this case, GSIS and HDMF members, taxpayers in general, 
or local taxpayers in particular because of the undetermined amounts given to this program arising from tax exemptions from real estate transactions. Um, the second issue is the legitimacy necessity. Is the passage of the law actually necessary to implement a housing program for teachers or special interest groups? Um, if time is of the essence, the, the executive branch uh, could determine whether or not existing charters of NHA, the local government code, or even the DBM chapter, uh, their, their laws would suffice to create such a program. Uh, particularly in SB 660, the main intent of the bill lies in section six. Uh, it legislates an expensive package of policy pronouncements, uh, housing finance rules, loan entitlement provisions, maximum interest rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's just a few provisions in the bill which I think should bear more discussion. Number one is funding allocation. You know, that idea in SB 660 to provide at least 60% of available funds granted to teachers earning less than 12,000 a month. Now, there is always a danger in legislating fixed amounts in the law because the law is permanent in nature, but the situation it proposes to govern will definitely change over time. You know, for example, 2019 salary rates for the lowest ranking public school teacher, salary grade 11, is already receiving above 20,000. If this bill is enacted as it is, the bill basically becomes smooth. Yes, we, we agree, uh, Mr. Atencio, that probably some provisions of, of the proposed measure are uh, out of date and this would probably need a, a review likewise. So, so in effect, uh, Mr. Atencio, you're saying that uh, uh, to, to grant a, to, to have a bill, to have a specific law for teachers uh, carving out the the carving out the next amount from a, 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 a fund which is supposed to be private might not master some legal uh, challenges. So, baka mali, yung, yung may sinasabi mo? Well, what, what we're saying is it opens up the issues to the other sectors who will feel they have an equal right to be yes. benefited from the same public fund. The nurses, uh, Special legislation has happened before. So, you know, it can work. You just have to manage the those kinds of issues coming through the deliberations and and in the imp implementation. Uh, there's there's just two other things I'd I'd like to present before the committee, uh, Mr. Senator. Is number one, if there is any special interest uh, housing program, uh, it is best to always involve the beneficiary, in this case, the public school teachers in the planning implementation and the project approval process. I've been involved in a few LGU housing projects and my experience is that, you know, these projects have become successful because from the start, the intended beneficiary were there to actually uh, so we, approve we, the housing uh, we configuration, the choice of developers, the package prices, etc. Because if they are not part of it, there's a chance that they may not buy into the housing project. Um, and lastly, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, perhaps instead of the traditional way of providing additional housing benefits, such as the bill, maybe you could consider creating a housing voucher system uh, for the targeted beneficiaries that they could use to either pay the monthly amortization or pay for a rental in the case of SB 934. Now, the voucher system as a public policy measure has been used quite successfully in many countries to replace things like subsidies, tax holidays, and, and other measures that are direct benefits but unspecified in their insertions or presence in the budget appropriations. The nice thing about vouchers is that, number one, the expense is quantifiable. It is a specific appropriation that is automatically reviewed every year. It's more transparent, it's easy to distribute and administer, it's also easy to audit. And under a housing voucher system, the legislative intent of both bills is also achieved at less bureaucratic cost. 
Uh, that's correct, uh, Mr. Think we have to explore more on the voucher system, but we have to have the teachers, the PSTA on board, and we have to get, get the concurrence of uh, not only DSHUD but DBM as well. So, siguro okay na yon. We, we hear that loud and clear that there has got to be a, a revision of the, two, the twin bills uh, that would uh, generate the same results on a more uh, realistic and up-to-date basis, especially with uh, the, the pandemic we're having right now. Uh, before we shift to the, with the indulgence of Senator Pia Cayetano, before we shift to uh, the last bill under consideration, may we hear from uh, Home Guarantee Court Fund uh, and lastly from the LRA. Siguro, take the three minutes na lang para we can, we can uh, cover enough ground because uh, we have several resource persons still waiting. Uh, Home Guarantee Fund, are you still there? Uh, attorney Mr. Jimmy Sarona of Home Guarantee Fund. Can you connect? I'm the fund. Yes, I'm, uh, yes, okay. I'm already connected. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, Home Guarantee Corporation is now merged as with Felix Sim and is now known as Philippine Guarantee Corporation. Uh, our, our program in Home Guarantee on Housing is still available and so we are uh, our existing program should be able to help the to achieve the goals of the proposed bill uh, Ani, uh, please address the the new issues relative to ho teachers housing cooperatives as well as uh the recently raised uh issue concerning portability uh yeah. and perhaps the vouchers uh, okay uh, on portability sir uh, I think the existing policies of pagibig in all the housing agencies, uh, they go into mortgage, real estate mortgage, and contract to sell. Uh, we need more study for the portability issue because of that existing policies. But uh, the, your your idea, your concept is it's worth studying because uh, we know that teachers are not temporarily assigned to a place. Tony, ganito na ito. Okay. Yung, yes, yung example ko kanina, nagsimula magturo sa Mulabe, yeah, lumipas. Para sa Pagadian, dadagdagan ko pa, yung anak gusto mag-aral sa Maynila, merong housing program sa Maynila, ang teachers, yung bang binayad ko sa Mulabe at binayad ko sa Pagadian, pwede kong bitbitin sa Maynila para yung mga anak ko na mag-aaral sa Maynila bilang guro, retired na ako, eh maituloy ko. Yun ang ibig ko pong sabihin doon. Just, just a quick... Uh, Reparte concerning that attorney. Ah, uh, you hindi sa ngayon sir ang tingin ko hindi siya pwede. Kailangan pag-aralan mabuti kasi ang existing nga uh, real estate mortgage ang uh, single loan lang sila eh. Ang mga existing policy natin. Okay, loud and clear. Uh, we, we hear that. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, we, we the committee expects a a a position paper relative to the three, three new uh, counter proposals. Uh, derived from this committee hearing. Uh, can we have that, Attorney? Uh, yes, sir. Within yes, sir. two weeks, thank you. Yes, and, sir. And the last would be uh, the Deputy Administrator of LRA, Attorney Le Leiretana. Ang pinag-uusapan dito, lupa na siguro, eh, yung titulo. Napakarami mga schools natin na hindi pa naman titulado. Uh, ginagamit na mga schools, pinagamit na mga LGUs, uh, wala pa titulo, pero tinatayuan natin ng mga, ng mga pampublikong gusali. LRA, are you still there? LRA, if LRA is not present, uh, again, with yes. the Senator Cayetano, and our resource persons. Itong third bill natin uh, probably might be of... LRA, you're there? Con we still have a connectivity problem. Mr. So, Chair, you said Tony po mag-reach lang Mr. Chair. Uh, ang klaro lang po siya na nabanggit niya nga po na marami pong lupa na hindi pa po titulado ng DepEd sa mga tuwid ni Mr. Chair ang isa pa pong kondisyon na dapat po natin tingnan kung magpapatayo po tayo ng living quarters hindi po pa bahay ni Mr. Chair kasi yung 
yung bill po ni Senator po uh, parang provision for living quarters po ang kanyang uh, nais na niya at yun po yung ating sinasuportahan para wala pong issue po clear na sinabi niyo po kanina na pag nalipat ang teacher eh sino yung magpapatuloy ng pagbabayad so, ang, ang aming sinasuportahan ni Sir Sir if ever is living quarters within the school premises Uh, if constructed by the teachers' cooperative, that would be a great idea. So, isang uh, dapat po natin ipaalang-alang na konsiderasyon ni Sir Sir ay kung wala pong titulo ito ng deport, itinan po natin kung ito yung conditional deport donation at hindi pa nga po nailipat. O, agad kung conditional, Sir Sir Sir, minsan na sinasabi po ng mga nag-donate, eh, para lamang yan na paaralan. Wala nang ibang pwedeng ipatayo dyan. So, kailangan po nating uh, tingnan po yun, Mr. Chief. O kaya, kung contract of this is trust ang uh, binigay naman po. So, uh, yun naman po, Mr. Chief, as some of the considerations uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the proposed measure. Alamat po. Thank you, Yusuf Gamali. The committee notes uh, your, your concern. So, in so far as Senate Bill uh, 660, Uh, the Housing Program for Teachers, authored by Senator Revilla, and Senate Bill 934, an act mandating the provision of free on-site uh, living quarters for public school teachers. Uh, this committee is suspending consideration of the twin bills. We now tackle Senate Bill number 65, authored by uh, Senator Cayetano, providing for the development of sustainable cities and communities in the country. And I ask the other resource persons present, uh, if you still have time, though it may not be directly your concern, uh, insofar as your offices are, are uh, concerned, to please take time to hear the, the presentations relative to Senate Bill number 65. Uh, may, may we ask the author, Senator Cayetano, if you have a, an opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, these are really just administrative matters. Um, we have international experts on sustainable cities, so I'd really like to give the time uh, to our resource person, Dr. Russo, and we also have our local experts, and I don't know if we will have time to accommodate both of them. But before that, I'd just like to put on record our request that uh, NED be called um, to attend our hearing because I requested this from the Secretariat However, the Secretariat said that they have already been called. But Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Chair, they had uh, attended the last hearing, but they did not speak on the SDG 11 target. And that's why their presence is necessary. So um, I just want to point out, and in the interest of time, I won't go through it, but um, SDG 11 target is very specific on uh, housing needs, sustainable transportation, cultural and natural heritage, green and public space, etc. So we need to hear from NEDA on um, where they are on these targets and uh, how COVID has um, affected it, have we backtracked. So I was a little bit surprised that the Secretariat would tell us that NEDA will be called. So can I just please request the presence of NEDA? And um, I would also like to be given the um, time to uh, suggest other experts because this is a very important bill, uh, relevant to the crisis that we are facing. And um, actually, even without the crisis, uh, this bill is important, but more so during this time. And we have much to learn from experts on sustainability. So I leave it at that, Mr. Chair, so that we can listen to the experts that we have today. Thank you. Uh, Senator Caetano, we apologize for the non-attendance of uh, NEDA, but uh, we, we assure you that if uh, a second hearing will be conducted, NEDA will be around. But uh, in the absence of NEDA, we'd like to take uh, advantage of the presence of uh, Dishud. The secretary is here, Secretary Del Rosario, because uh, apparently the, the proposed bill concerns human settlements, and the Secretary of Human Settlements is around. And one of the items of uh, sustainable development goal number 11 is culture. So we have we have the presence here of the DepEd family. So DepEd, uh, I advise you to uh, stick around together with uh, Secretary Del Rosario. So if uh, the, the resource person from Australia is around, Dr. Ruzu, uh, uh, may, may, may we have your presentation, you're recognized. Uh, 
Dr. Ruzu. Well, good morning, uh, Senator Pierre Fontano and uh, committee members. I hope you can hear me. Go ahead, sir. I uh, understand you're very, uh, you're very clear. Thank you. Uh, or good. Possibly. Uh, okay, so just sharing content now. <laughs> Okay, so this is about the implications of consecutive and co concurrent crises, trends on sustainability in 2030. So it's a futures presentation um, about the impact of uh, new crises. So normally uh, futurists talk about preferred, possible and probable futures. Now international bushfires and COVID-19 have prompted the need to discuss essential futures that aid sustainability in the face of consecutive crisis threats. However, Consecutive crises are less relevant to a 2030 scenario. 2030 is much more likely to have conditions causing concurrent crises, so multiple crises happening together. So while we are thinking about preferred futures for people, planet and prosperity, we must create essential futures for transitioning and transforming cities to survive and thrive, to save lives and livelihoods through alternative concurrent crises. So this analysis of four scenarios clarifies that it is helpful for countries faced with consecutive and concurrent crises to become not just domestically focused with cities managing symptoms of sustainability crises, but also internationally focused with the cities managing the causes of sustainability crises for cities. Scenario one is double trouble. It's that we work only for this generation. This scenario is similar to 2019 with bushfires and COVID-19. The unique issues here, uh, I'll pick one here, it's that the transmission rate is now 1.25. So that means four people with the disease spread it to one other person. Now, why does that sound high? Because global warming by 2030 has increased by perhaps 2.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And the causes, this causes increased animal hosts via rainfall, increase in rat breeding and mobility of animals, brings diseases, and this scenario of COVID-30 is spread by dogs. Now, no cities are fully prepared for this, because, but yet scientists are currently warning us that this is where our next pandemic will emerge from. So a 20% case fatality may emerge in that scenario. The feeling is we should have known better after COVID-19. Scenario one strategies for cities would then be to do normal things that we've done during COVID-19. Cities provide updates about COVID safety and urge mask use and improve walk, walking track, track width to international standards to upgrade levels of uh, cycling access to help active and healthy lifestyles. More transformative mechanisms would seek causes. They would separate pets from humans, rethink wet markets, continue to create active lifestyles, but employ internationally and locally and manage invasive plants. So the suggestion is that scenario one won't work in 2030 until transformational shifts are made. So scenario two is about hide and seek, and that is that uh, well, well, in this scenario, we have the lowest case fatality rate. International climate action contributions have been mitigating the worst effects of climate change in this scenario. So by contributing internationally to climate change, we are keeping global warming down below one and a half degrees above pre-industrial carbon levels. So this scenario has the lowest fatality rates. International climate actions are assisting in terms of flooding, cyclones, drought and heat waves. And during COVID-19, transmission was higher in polluted cities, and, and as was the seriousness of contracting COVID-19. Thus, in 2030, cities that contribute greatly to renewables and electric vehicles and things like that uh, will save lives. Also, holistic arrangements mean that other medical priorities must continue to be managed. Healthy lifestyle choices where people eat foods that reduce comorbidity of cardiovascular disease, cancer and diabetes that would put people into a higher risk category when facing a pandemic, they must also be met. Those challenges must be met. So the uniqueness is that it's a best case scenario and the strategies for a level two, uh, scenario two would be the whole redesign of cities and treatment of causes to protect cities from multiple types of, of crises. And that's protection of water from drought, fire, flood and sea level rise, to create energy self-sufficiency, to have all water, wastewater treated for reuse, 
to identify all manufactured items in the city and ensure that they are transparently made such that their lifestyles are known from, from, uh, from birth to, uh, to graves. Scenario three is the triple scoop of crises. Now, this is where we talk about consecutive, uh, moving from consecutive to concurrent crises. It's all about concurrent crises, treating domestic sy symptoms during lockdown uh, in this scenario. With multiple crises such as mutating COVID-30 and increased international average temperatures, cyber attack, cyclones, earthquakes, the economy can't afford all of the things that we'd like in terms of emergency services and assets and infrastructure, fire trucks, planes, medical equipment, resources, every city. So it, this means that every, every citizen should know their role, should have a role and should be able to play that role rather than being waged to sit at home. So the threat is, if we don't do this, it's in, an increased uh, um, spike in, in, in death rates. So the suggested response to concurrent crises in cities in scenario three is strengthening of coordinated federal, state and local emergency services. But it's also, what we're not doing now necessarily, is multi-skilling of emergency services personnel in a range of systems. Multi-skilling our medical, community and aged care workers in a range of systems. Increasing the number of emergency services staff, equipment and services. And developing more links between health services across the levels of government training more community members in counselling of mental health, things that will mean that people are, have multiple roles and can play those roles when necessary. Okay, so scenario four is the egalitarian grace under pressure. It's the where countries uh, treat international causes of many crises while in lockdown. The countries that have the highest income ahead of population are in this scenario. They include Australia and Canada, and we would hope by 2030, the Philippines. So they are able to combat diseases symptomatically and at the root cause, example, by increasing biodiversity. So the suggested response to concurrent crises in cities, for, in, cities in scenario four is to transform systems to renewable energy, divest from fossil fuels, create 100% energy efficiency, move public transport or increase public transport and create different forms of electric public transport and hydrogen and other forms of uh, non-fossil fuel based energy systems and mitigate all sorts of uh, measures using community and local uh, cities knowledge. So as the urgency for essential futures emerges, I suggest the following that uh, we move beyond reactive neoliberal approaches that would exacerbate probable future crises that do not consider a lockdown scenario, but also consider this newer question of 2030. What are the best strategies when some cities will be required to work openly to quell multiple crises that people won't always be able to lock down in with multiple crises? So we need to move beyond a focus of symptoms that would ignore a worsening of causes of crises. We need to move beyond the culture of unilateral decision making that would develop a culture of domesticism and a lack of innovation. So we need to move beyond non-participation of climate action that would increase global warming. And we need to anticipate the possible causes of multiple crises rather than just cities having a vision of consecutive crises. In order to do that, we need to engage our communities and help them to develop the strategies, actions, policies, the mechanisms that would make them more personally reliable and uh, have a role to play in the face of concurrent crises. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. Uh, Senator Pia, any uh, additional relative to this? But, but from the, uh, Senator Pia, but with your indulgence, but from the chair, I think uh, this is very timely because we have the uh, Department of Human Settlements and Secretary Deliserius here, and our resource person, Dr. Russo, mentioned a lot, a lot of times, several times, the year 2030. And if we if we look at Philippine situation and global uh, situation, 730 million uh, would be living in cities by 2030, and by 2050. 68% of the global population will be living in uh, cities as well, uh, more than two-thirds. And the same is true with the Philippines. So we have, we have here the, the DILG in the League of Cities of the Philippines 
I, I think this is very timely because, uh, Dr. Russo, for your information, we have a newly created Department of Human Settlements in the Philippines. And uh, while, while they are still in their uh, infancy stage, I think Secretary De Rosario, uh, the head is uh, up, up, to, up to his task in, in crafting viable uh, land use plans uh, in, in various, in various uh, cities in the Philippines. It's not just uh, they're trying to make this more updated uh, in terms of uh, responding to uh, several, not just uh, health crisis, but even uh, natural uh, disasters in terms of disaster risk mitigation. May, 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 may we know fr from your end, Dr. Russo, how, how, would you, how would you advise a newly created department to, 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 address, to address all of this uh, before we, we tackle the nitty gritty of the proposed measure? How, how do you how do you how do you how would you advise a newly created uh, government office uh, in charge with human settlements in in uh, confronting some of the perils that you just mentioned? Thank you for the question, uh, Sir. I, I uh, have been in this role before working in uh, state governments, and uh, uh, the uh, first thing that we would do um, is to create a vision policy strategies and actions with the community members so that we aren't just looking at for major cities a single um, vision that ha that has not considered a range of the suburban priorities the different customized um, perspectives and uh, so we basically we're consulting stakeholders and community members to build their knowledge of what they would do uh, in their communities to assist in addition to that, uh, we would then try to uh, build strategies that we, you know, we could res resource to put in place for concurrent crises. So that means that uh, the, the, the window uh, between, say, bushfires and uh, COVID-30 uh, might be a lot closer. It might be closed. So that means, so what, what strategies do we have? We might need to have more services, but we might also need to have uh, multi-skilling of talents. And that will then influence educators um, and what uh, uh, you know university students would then choose to study emergency services would then choose to, to uh, study a range of service types so engagement is important there was a bit, I, I i saw from your presentation the, the advantage of island nations and we surely uh, would want to take advantage of that secretary del rosario are you still there to make a quick? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm here. Yes, yes. Uh, any quick response? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Pinaritano, Dr. Russo. Uh, actually, the Philippines was awarded by the UNDP uh, three years ago for mainstreaming climate change and disaster risk reduction in our sustainment development goals. And the department fully supports Senate Bill number 65 because this will further provide authority to the department to assist and uh, provide guidance to cities and municipalities in crafting their respective land use and development plans. The preparation of CLUP involves the planning of the entire jurisdiction of a local government jury. And the CLUP is a physical plan where an intensive study and analysis of LGD's physical conditions and resources are conducted to determine and allocate suitable areas for specific urban development to address the needs and demands of our cities and its population in terms of social, economic, and infrastructure development. Integrated in the preparation of the CLUP is climate change and disaster risk reduction. We have been doing this, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Your Honours. And on climate and risk, the department is strengthening the resilience of our cities and municipalities by integrating climate and disaster risk assess as assessment in the preparation of the local shelter plans, urban expansion planning, and land development controls. These are ongoing activities and already embedded in our system. And the department is confident that the land use planning processes we carry out now in partnership with numerous national government agencies 
the stakeholders and local government units have substantially incorporated the objectives and development frameworks of the Sustainable Development Goals 11 and 12, as stated in this uh, charter. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, we are abreast of these uh, developments. And these are now are being integrated. And Senate Bill Number 65 will further support the efforts of the national government and the department in fine-tuning and strengthening the crafting of the comprehensive land use plans of all municipalities and cities nationwide. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you, Secretary Del Rosario. This is uh, the Secretary of Defense still here, uh, the Secretary of Mali. Uh, yes, yes uh, with, 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 with all due respect to uh, Senator Pia, uh, the the bill uh, probably, if if this representation would be allowed to make an amendment, should include the the notion of uh, having education and literacy uh, upgrading, scaling as as part of the parameters. Uh, uh, Senator Pia. That's why I invited I invited uh, the Department of Education here because uh, education is not just a a an ingredient, but a a a a, a core ingredient likewise of uh, the United Nations Development Sustainable Development Agenda. So so probably we can make uh, education one of the targets to be uh, determined by by NEDA. Uh, especially uh, literacy, the literacy rate, in so far as the the adults are concerned. Uh, uh, Yusek Kumali, can, can you have a, a brief uh, response uh, to the presentation made by Dr. Ruzo? Well, uh, we completely agree with you to the uh, to the event that we have just uh, articulated with you here. And in fact, uh, our good commentator Pia uh, very well know that uh, we have an education future thinking unit created by our uh, mom, Lili Guillaume, uh, headed by our chief of staff, uh, Andrew Secretary, Nepo Malandian. We, we completely agree with the, team, with the uh, objectives of Senate Team uh, 65 and uh, how uh, uh, education will fit in the model sustainable cities and communities as uh, articulated in section 3. We, we definitely uh, support that to the Senator Pia. Thank you, thank you, Yusek. And, and probably as an additional input, likewise, uh, for the NEDA, NEDA targets, which, which were now uh, number 15, I added education, perhaps housing. Uh, right to adequate housing should likewise be a, a target that should be incorporated in, in, in the bill. So may, may we ask likewise the, the comment from uh, the DILG, uh, because the DILG under the proposed bill is supposed to develop a grant or cash award incentive for LGUs that are able to achieve their annual target set by uh, NEDA. Uh, DILG, are you still there? Sir Chair. You, you said uh, it's a very? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, under Senate Bill Number 65, as understood, the focus of herein proposed Sustainable Cities and Communities Act is the promotion of local autonomy and community empowerment, which is one of the powers and functions of the department. Funded by the General Appropriations Act, the department has been implementing a number of programs, as you have mentioned, Mr. Chair and projects to promote sustainability of communities at the local level. Thus, we manifest nothing but support to this proposed measure. In view thereof, the department interposes no objection to section five of the proposed measure, stating the support from the national government shall be forced to the department of the interior and local government by providing technical assistance. However, as to the resource augmentation to LGUs to assist them in transitioning into sustainable cities and communities mentioned in the same provision, may we clarify on what specific augmentation is being referred to? If the same includes fiscal resources, 
may we respectfully recommend that the same act provide the corresponding funding source thereof. In so far as the proposed development of grant or cash award incentive scheme for LGs by this department, May we respectfully mention that the ILG is already implementing similar programs through the seal of good local government or governance. In this respect, the department welcomes the proposed incentive scheme specific to sustainability by LGU, a program counterpart for that of good governance and good housekeeping. As such, a funding source earmarked for the said program is likewise respectfully recommended. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Secretary Pia, uh, would you like to respond to the uh, request of the DILG to be clarified uh, as to the real intent of Section 5 when resource augmentation uh, was uh, mentioned? Senator Pia. Yes. Mr. Chair, may I defer the discussion to take advantage of our international resource person first? To the, let, let, I'd like to focus on some reaction on uh, his presentation, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, uh, so, and by the way, Mr. Chair, I, and my comments, although directed to Dr. Russo, no, includes the engagement and reaction of our secretary and the resource persons here. Because at the end of the day, um, these are the agencies that will be implementing this bill. So it's these are just really um, sort of questions that I'm posing. Um, Dr. Russo mentioned that the best case scenario um, for sustainable cities really would be to set them up in such a way that they can cope with the next pandemic. And honestly, when I drafted this bill, a pandemic was not on my mind. No, my in my mind was really the targets of the SDG. But now it is very clear to us that there is also um, a pandemic that that is looming in our future. In the, um, Taiwan is already preparing for the next pandemic, and the resources um, that what we would like to achieve is a scenario where uh, cities and communities do not have to go into a lockdown situation while they are coping with the pandemic. So he gave a few factors. So what I'd like to um, uh, maybe get additional uh, information from Dr. Russo and then also um, any comments from the secretary is um, how how do you actually see this unfolding? Like, you know, you I, I, I caught a few um, keywords. Like, for example, the healthcare system obviously has to be stronger. Uh, but you mentioned emergency, the emergency set, uh, emergency department um, area of a healthcare system. That one is a little bit unclear to me. It's the first time I've heard an emergency department. And then you mentioned the wet market, that the biodiversity is a very critical factor here. And I've heard that many times discussed. I, I've heard a speech by a um, scientist who, whose specialty is that. And uh, they said that wet markets should be closed down in the Philippines. And a lot of Asian countries are very wet market centric. Life revolves around our markets. So, and but I have not yet heard a local discussion on uh, what are the dangers in the marketplace. I'm assuming. You know, those selling vegetables are very safe. Those selling uh, other meat products are also safe. So I don't know what it is about the wet market to make it dangerous. And this would involve another um, agency, I suppose, Mr. Chair. No, that's why my 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 request is that we can have a a hearing where we have all these agencies attending because many studies also show that the sir our survival and our being able to cope really rely on the sustainability of a community, not really on a countrywide basis, but the community being able to sustain itself. And that's why, um, again, as I said, the, the input that I was picking up from Dr. Russo was very important. Like he said, the education system, that's not actually mentioned here, but definitely we should include it because if you talk about sustainability um, uh, during this pandemic, one of the recommendations I made um and um i don't know if uh you said mali uh, our recommendations that we send the president through our comments to the president report which is you was that but i mentioned it in the hearing um on DepEd a few last week 
was um, how do you deal with COVID in far flung areas? Now they're considered the areas that you would possibly build the last mile schools where there's no COVID there. Now, what are the chances that the teachers there would actually be having face to face learning? students. So I don't need an answer now, Dr. Omali, because I really want this to be a broader truth. That is the thing you know, that I understand um, Dr. Ruzo is painting for us. How do you build these communities that are resilient and that can cope with multiple um, crises happening one on top of the other? Like in the Philippines, that, not, that normally would be a natural disaster. It could be an act of terrorism. So it could be so many things on top of each other. And I'd really like a step-by-step. -step, um, I appreciate the response of the secretary, but the focus was really on climate change and uh, disaster resiliency, you know? But there are so many other aspects here. So, um, so Dr. Russo, um, can, you, uh, can you respond quickly to some of those? Um, just give a little bit more detail on, um, you mentioned the, the vision, setting the vision, but then you also had key points in your presentation, which you ran very quickly through. Could you elaborate on that? And then maybe we can get a reaction from the secretary as well. Go ahead, say, uh, Russo. Thank you, uh, Senator, Thank you for your uh, questions. Regarding wet markets, certainly the with global warming, what that's going to drive famine. And essentially, it, it, when you have uh, situations where people find that uh, food is not at low cost or available, they then turn to wet markets more readily. And uh, the culture of using wet markets increases. But the transformation that could be made is to integrate national codes into the, the uh, management of wet markets and perhaps transfer a lot of the wet markets into shopping centres so that they are in fact regulated and, and delivered uh, under a quality uh, circumstance, quality environment. Um, you know, meaning that the uh, both the regulators and the uh, shop owners themselves have, have met and agreed on codes and standards and, and efficiently uh, have those standards monitored. Uh, but in terms of um, you know how you how you do that kind of um, meta level work with cities, you engage you with your mayors and your councillors uh, and uh, and the citizens um, through futures thinking workshops. We did this on the Gold Coast um, with uh, the, uh, of Australia with uh, twenty over twenty six workshops and engaged all of the councillors and uh, Mayor Ron Clark at the time and you know, created amazing outcomes. And it basically put, um, brings international stakeholders into the city and has, uh, gives them an opportunity to understand where the uh, areas for investment are and what the city really wants uh, in, in, in order to transfer form. Plus, from the mayors and councillors through to the staff, everyone's aware that the city is trying to innovate. And that means that new ideas are brought to councillors and, and, and policy makers in management. Uh, now, I was recently giving a talk to the Australian Federal Police in Canberra, and this was just before the, uh, this was in November, just before the bushfires and COVID-19 uh, uh, started. Uh, and we talked at length about disaster management coordination centres that are starting to emerge in some councils um, and the need to integrate uh, the priorities from the federal policy environment down through the state and, and local uh, decision making processes. So the federal government also has to be on board and aware uh, and working with state government. Um, and then there's the opportunity to work internationally with ASIO and, uh, and, and, and different uh, uh, sectors of policing when it comes to cyber attack, because cyber attack is another major potential crisis area, and most countries aren't ready for a nationwide cyber attack. Um, so disaster management coordination centres then act at the local level to uh, help citizens to move swiftly um, to where they need to be, into roles that they need to embrace, and creates a culture and behaviour of participation rather than rebellion. So people are aware up front of the importance of being united and, and that the goal is factually based, evidentially based, and will lead to the most successful social, economic and environmental outcome. Uh, so yes, there's, um, by engaging citizens, you can create uh, empowerment, but also educate citizens across all uh, uh, 
corporate plus uh, non-government and community organisations as well as local government and state government organisations. So there is important, great importance in thinking ahead. And the reason for thinking ahead is that we are planning for 2030, the population is going to be much larger by 2030. There are going to be many more people living in cities by 2030. Many of the Australian cities are going to increase by between a third and two thirds in terms of Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, and Perth and Adelaide. So. The number of um, uh, houses and infrastructure, et cetera, that's got to be provided that is, that is safe and can withstand crises has to be uh, understood up front. So we're managing today for uh, very different conditions. For, by the time we deliver our, our promises and our policies and strategic actions, the world will have changed. So that we have to understand what kind of world we're planning for. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Russo. If I may, if I may uh, add something. Uh, perhaps for, for the uh, quick understanding of our uh, foreign guest, uh, our current system here in the Philippines, and this is ingrained in, in traditional practice, even our Department of Public Works, our, uh, we have, a, we have a, a separate window for, for local government units, for markets, uh, the local government, uh, local, local government stabilization fund, and and I, I understand uh, the League of Provinces, they're, they're here virtually present as well as the League of Cities. In the Philippines, when, when you construct a market, uh, it's, it's uh, standard to have a wet section and a dry section. The wet section would usually cater to your fish, your, uh, your uh, poultry products, among others, the meat, uh, fresh meat, etc. So the, the notion of uh, refrigerated and packed uh, sealed uh, meat products are probably in our grocery stores and our, our supermarkets. But in the rural area, especially those with fish ports, usually you, you buy them directly from the fishermen in the ports. Uh, and and these are not, these are not uh, refrigerated. Perhaps some ice cubes are there. So this is the culture of the Filip Filipinos. But if you equate that with what transpired uh, several months ago with the Wuhan, Probably if you're uh, uh, thinking about the Wuhan incident, we don't sell here, we don't mix uh, exotic foods, uh, goods with, with our uh, fresh market uh, products. So that's, that's, the, that's the, that probably is the difference. Uh, the wet markets are, are really part of, not just of the culture, but even a standard building practi practice. So you have the dry section <coughs> composed of your uh, vegetables and your clothing, uh, parallels as well, and the wet market would cater to the fish and and your uh, sea, sea, seafood items. So uh, I think the 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 ILG is listening, the BM is listening. You pro we probably have to more be, be attuned with hygienic uh, and uh, other uh, health protocols in so far as the treatment of this is concerned. But we've been we've been doing this. No no exotic no exotic products being sold here. Uh, just for the uh information of our foreign guests but just the same we we, we have to uh, attend to the health and uh, hygienic protocols as well so uh with the permission of senator pia we still have one resource person i think dr cruz and then we'll we'll revert back to dr russo i think you will you will stick around Ito, nakita ko na yung other guests natin. Ang dami pa pala. Uh, league of provinces are you still here uh, wala, League of Cities, but you're listening. So can we have Dr. Cruz, who will be making another presentation? Uh, Dr. Russo, stick around, and then we'll probably uh, combine your presentation with, with uh, Dr. Cruz. Dr. Cruz, uh, go ahead. Please unmute. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on mute. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So again, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, here today, you are representing the Philippines, uh, Philippine Society, a uh, Philippine Futures Thinking Society, or Philippine Futures. And uh, of course, myself as a as a professional futures. When I was listening to the conversation a while ago, uh, uh, it reminds me of the five things of, of, the, of the five essential, critical drivers of change that will impact the future of cities by the year 2040. 
you know, this was an output that we had when we facilitated the United Nations framework for climate change. You know, imagining the climate change world in the year 2040. And uh, these three things are very important, you know. Uh, one is food, second is nature, third is water, fourth is human security, and five is health. You know, in that workshop, what we did, we did uh, it for like a hundred visionaries and leaders all around the world, you know, trying to imagine alternative futures and preferred future scenarios of the world in the year 2040. Now, uh, what I'm going to do here is just to give you a quick take on the insights that I had when I was, you know, hired as a, as a senior consulting futurist for a number of cities in Asia. And uh, of course, when I facilitated the Sustainable City Futures Workshop in Penang, Malaysia, in Bandung City, West Java Province, uh, South Korea, and the Philippines. I hope I could give the details of the scenarios, but given you know, the time constraints, I might not be able to do so, but what I'm gonna do is just share you the insights. You know, as a professional futurist uh, facilitating sustainable cities in, for almost a decade now, the insight that emerged from a city future workshop that we had in Penang in Malaysia, organized by Think City, you know, tops my list of the most provocative and insightful thought on sustainable city futures. If I may share, this insight emerged much in a post-workshop conversation that I had with Datu and Murakaza, a leading, leading civil society figure and consumer rights activist in Malaysia. The insight was, if you want to know where any country's future is heading, look at the main cities. If it cannot manage its cities, it has little hope in imagining its future. How we manage our cities today will determine the future. And I would like to note that the keywords here are four. One is managing cities. Two is the capacity of people and institutions to anticipate, you know, the known knowns and the unknown unknowns and imagine plural possibilities and preferred features. Third, the main cities being the big, huge mega predictors for super valuables and change drives and shapes people's and communities' lives. And of course, a country's future. Now, if you want to expand that further, the futures of our world's mega cities, including Manila, of course, will determine the future of this planet and human civilization for the next 100 years. While cities are known to be the bad weather, we trend things, you know, of the next big things to come. You always would see that in, uh, on, on cities imagining and implementing this uh, bellwether ideas or innovations. And cities and city dwellers are also the most vulnerable to the impacts of not just pandemic, but I would say existential risk and threats. What are these existential risks and threats? These are drastic or permanent events that could cause human extinction, like COVID-19, climate change, global warming, bioterrorism, asteroid impact, engineered pandemics, global internet shutdown, massive earthquakes, or supervolcanic eruptions. Bottom line is, I would say, the insight uh, in that workshop wisely accentuates the need and the urgency for us to invest in city futures by building our personal, collective, civic, institutional, and organizational capacity to not just anticipate and imagine, but you know, experiment, improvise, invent prototypes to create sustainable city futures. Now, just to give you the insight that you know, of, uh, of the sustainable city futures workshop that we had in Songdo and Seoul, South Korea, that are emerging as models. Of course, we know the cities are already smart cities and they are sustainable. They are now shifting from smart to regenerative societies. Now, Songdo and Seoul, South Korea are active cases of world shifting or transforming from smart to regenerative society. Now, what is a regenerative society? Regenerative society seeks to restore the city's relationship. If you want to be resilient, we were talking about uh, wet markets, among other things, you know, with nature. With our focus on inclusive well-being, health, and happiness for everyone in the present in the future. Now, if you want to innovate the future of wet markets, you know, there is a tool that we use in the futures community. In fact, that was designed by Google. It's called a moonshot thinking. You know, a moonshot thinking tries to reframe, you know, the context of a wet market from a futures perspective. 
you know, and uh, there's a tool that actually enables people to imagine and even make the future of the web. Now, uh, just to give you an example, if, if, the, if the future of wet market is at risk, given the fact that we are now experiencing global pandemic, you might perhaps shift the idea of from wet market to creating wellness markets, right? So uh, that's just an idea. Then, uh, uh, just to give my last point, is that when we plan and use futures thinking as a methodology or as, as a design, you know, to innovate, from the future is that very crucial in the conversation that we should have. I think that should also occur in public policy planning and agenda setting is reframing. You know, you can actually reframe things and stuff, you know, put new spin into old old ideas by gaming it or playing your future's assumptions. Because of course the future is not flat. The future is there's no one single future out there. There are possibilities, but or possibilities. But how might a Philippine city access this alternative future or range of past possibilities. We could do that through reframing activities in event. Now, just to give you an example, for the sake of play, you know, imagine the city of Taguig or as emerging or operating as like an open source city in the year 2040. Or perhaps let's just say the city of Lawag or the city of Kalamba, exhibiting the characteristics and traits of cities as living organized organisms, as extensions of indigenous cultural and the natural world. Now, if you frame the future of a city in that context, it might help you enable you to think about possibilities or innovations in the, con uh, in the context of wet markets. If you try to see your supermarkets as extensions of living organisms, now, as an alternative city, you know, these questions, I would like to leave this committee some few questions uh, before I end my presentation, because I only have like a couple of minutes here. Now, if we try to imagine the future of Philippine cities in the year 2040, how might that look like? How might it feel to live in a world in like, for example, best case, worst case, or weird future scenarios with the Philippines? What might a day in the life of a Miguelio or a Lawagenio to live in an alternative sustainable city futures world? What might the drivers of change be that might influence the emergence of such city future? Now, if the city is reframed as an open source, just to give you an example again, the city may likely emphasize, invest, and accelerate the creation of open systems, open networks, and open innovation hubs. You know, uh, that enables people to participate in the creation of, of new products, services, and value. Now, how might sustainability look like in that context? Uh, just to give you an example, open source cities is like an open source software developed through a process of open source collaboration. You have internet, bitcoins, and Bitex. You know, that is a product of open source community. Now, if the city is perceived or imagined as a living organized organism, an extension of the natural world, then your sustainable city futures narrative and strategies also changes because a, a living organic city evokes champions the values of what we call heal being concepts you know or heal being technologies indigenous knowledge values and resources and how the city it will emphasize how the city interfaces with nature how it manages rivers mountains biodiversity carbon impacts so I, I think uh, that is what I could uh, share with you at, uh, right now. And uh, I, I would love to have a, a conversation about this. Thank you very much, Senator Pena and Senator Francis. This has been a very uh, productive uh, exchange with you and Dr. Ruzo. I, I, I understand uh, Senator Cayetano is asking for a, a second hearing because we really have uh, to tackle uh, a lot of other uh, novel ideas here that, that are really uh, meant to improve uh, the lives of uh, uh, city residents. But cities, uh, for, to clarify this, League of Cities is, is listening as well as the League of Provinces, cities would not just refer to your uh, your generic city in the Philippines, uh, which is just 112 plus, or uh, it refers to a, a an urban area, it refers to a a, a densified area, it, it probably would include uh, municipalities as well. So ha having said that, probably we can get a quick reaction from uh, Senator Pia and then the ILG. Uh, and because I understand, I'm, I'm really sorry because the the necrological services for the late Senator Ibilla would be starting at 1040 and we have a very uh, limited time, but th this has been a very fruitful exchange. 
uh, and we'll be having a second hearing. And I assure Senator Cayetano that Neda will be around, as well as some other city mayors. Uh, Senator Pia, do you have a, 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 a quick uh, word? And then we we'll have sen uh, Dr. Russo and uh, DILG as well. No, no more, Mr. Chair. I'll save the time and give it to them. Um, I just want to emphasize, though, that Dr. Russo also mentioned that uh, this sustainable city should also be um, provide that, that environment that will allow for healthier living, again, to prevent, to, um, to prevent a lockdown situation. So that would be very simple, like having more walk paths. You know, people should be able to walk. And if his honor would recall, one of the problems we face is that in highly congested areas, we can allow the senior citizens to go outside to go for a walk because there's really no safe area. So things like that, Mr. Chair, um, I'm so happy that we have our Secretary of Human Settlement here to take these things into consideration in the development of future um, areas, uh, living areas, because these are things we really have to plan for, Mr. Chair. So I'll cut it short there to give the time to our resource person, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Senator Cayetan. And then as an added uh, input for the DILG, Perhaps section six, when it talks of incentives for transitioning into uh, sustainable cities, would would uh, require DILG to be more creative in in crafting not just your existing seal of good governance award, but other other uh, incentives as well. I, I was a former mayor, and I have been advocating for uh, I have been advocating for an increase. EBM is listening an increase of internal revenue allotment for cities that are performing well. So my, my era proposal is a performance based. So if you are a, a city or an LGU, for instance, that uh, was able to comply with the, uh, the SGD standards, you, you should have more, you should, you should, have, you should get more uh, internal revenue allotment, not just your fixed uh, formula. That's my my thinking into this. But in the next he uh, hearing, we expect the DILG to perhaps uh, propose or create a more uh, detailed response as to how they would like Section 6 to be rewarded or crafted, thinking along that line. Uh, Dr. Russo, just one final question. Uh, you mentioned something about cities in the Philippines uh, should have multiple multiple visions uh, I, I i i was struck with the word uh, multiple words with multiple vision what would it mean that uh, cities would would be given uh, a semblance of more uh, autonomy in in terms of uh, pursuing uh, this the sustainable development goals or uh, because we 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 more or less would want cities to and local government units to move in one direction uh, and, and it would entail a single marching order, single uh, goal, but, but would it, as playing devil's advocate, would multiple vision be a more or less a shotgun approach on how to arrive at a certain goal? Because you'll be having, you know, the politics here, you'll be having several uh, directions or goal posts, so to speak, uh, Dr. Uso. Oh, thanks, Your Honour. I, uh, in Australia, when the state government introduced a requirement for city councils to create a, uh, a long-term community plan in each city, uh, the result uh, was great transformation. And it meant that each of the cities was able to customise their long-term view to the strengths and unique assets of those cities. So, four cities in uh, southeast Queensland. We've got the Sunshine Coast and its strengths are really about its natural environment. So it's able to suggest that uh, they enhance the environment, increase biodiversity, increase tourism. Then there's the Gold Coast, which is about investment and the housing market and uh, developing uh, tall towers and so on. And they're, uh, following their long-term plan, they created the the Commonwealth Games, light rail, uh, health and knowledge precinct, uh, mul uh, many billions of dollars worth of assets were added within about 10 years of that plan and completely transformed the city. 
Uh, then there's Brisbane as a capital city, which um, tends to reflect many of these values. And then fourthly, Logan City, which is a people-centred city. And people who are less wealthy uh, need different types of uh, empowerment strategies, um, different types of TAFE or, or technical and further education strategies, um, different uh, transport, public transport needs. So they customise their long-term plans to their cities so to help authorities and policymakers uh, allocate funding appropriately. Uh, so this is a, uh, a you know a wonderful opportunity to transform cities by engaging them to uh, customise their long-term plans and then uh, align those plans not only to SDGs, sustainable development goals, but also to their annual corporate plan and to their three-year uh, corporate plan plus their planning and development assessment city plan or town plan. So. Uh, working underneath a, a regional framework, uh, they then establish objectives that uh, to customise their cities in line with the regional framework, which should encompass the SDGs, uh, so that you create a unified framework that allows customisation. Uh, there are vast advantages in doing that, and that, of course, signals to communities where they would best uh, you know, identify uh, in terms of uh, their personal goals, uh, but also uh, they have an upfront understanding of where the city would like to go in the next 10 years, so investors can come in and contribute to those goals and speak to the mayors about those possibilities. So each of the cities can go out and, cons and consult and create a summit around uh, multiple um, types of futures and the different investors from different industries, whether it's solar or um, uh, public transport uh, or beaches or um, parklands, will all be able to attend and contribute knowing that they are welcome and that's where the city wants to go. Thank you, Dr. Caruso. Uh, Senator Cayetano, you have a you have the opportunity to have the closing uh, uh, remarks for this uh, hearing, Senator Pia. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, there's still so much more to discuss when it comes to like, our resource person. And I may request that um, the representatives from all the agencies are present in our hearings because we, we jump from one um, uh, topic to another and uh, we, we just go with the view of our uh, uh, resource person. So it would be good if they're just all present, right, Mr. Chair, so that we can have a comprehensive uh, discussion. I'd like to thank Dr. Russo and Dr. For their uh, joining us today, and thank you all for being here. And I support your, your uh, I support your uh, recommendation on the uh, era. Uh, I was going to answer my quick answer to the uh, section seven. I really intended that to just be a discussion point. Um, as the chairman of the committee on ways and means, I, I understand the limitations that we have on granting incentives. But I put that in there precisely so that we can explore. Uh, I, I am actually really not a big believer of incentives. I believe that moving to sustainability is the right thing to do. You don't need incentives to do that. But um, if there's a mechanism where we can support you know, to prioritize it, why not? So I support the uh, recommendation the chair made. Thank you. Chairman. Senator Chairman. Uh, also, ah, so, 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 yes. Uh, I'm Sir Chairman, uh, uh, I think I would just like uh, to request uh, Senator Pia that the department will be included in the technical working group because sustainable uh, cities and communities planning will entail two major uh, aspects, the crafting of the CLUP and the crafting of the uh, comprehensive development plan. CLUP is within the mandate of the Department of Human Settlement, and the Comprehensive Development Plan is within DILG and the LGU. The programs and uh, the plans and programs and projects of both groups will have to be merged to come up with a budget. And we have already identified as part of our policy framework, and we have been conducting uh, uh, consultations and uh, dialogues since May to input the, the pandemic uh, scenario. So this can be uh, inputted in the CLUP, and then the Comprehensive Development Plan will be budgeted by the LGU in their uh, uh, project implementation, uh, Mr. Sherman. So I would like to request 
let the department be included in the technical working group of Senator Pia so that the, the, the whole uh, policy uh, bill formulation will be complete. Because without us, we are not included in the technical working group, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I assure you, Secretary, uh, Senator Cayetano, uh, uh, notify you and you will be noticed. Uh, Having said that, I, I think we have uh, exhausted our time. The necrological ceremonies here in the Senate is about to, to commence. I'd like to thank all our resource persons, especially uh, Dr. Russo, Senator Cayetano, for your attendance. And upon recommendation of uh, Senator Cayetano, we will be having a second hearing considering the wide spectrum of uh, uh, details that we need to uh, scrutinize here, uh, especially uh, Senate Bill the Senate, Senate Bill number 65. So uh, with that and without objection, this hearing, this committee hearing is hereby suspended. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair.